presentation is Food Bank Lakeside, and it's presented by Steve Taylor and a bunch of other folks who are going to talk to us. I don't know if you've ever attended one of the events here before, but they're going to, the different coordinators and different people are going to share their experiences of what um, they're doing with the families that are on the other side of the lake, but actually they're in Chapala, they're in Ahi, they're all over the place, and uh, hundreds of families. Hi, Patty, how many people are you all feeding a week? I have no idea, but 700 families a month. 700 and, families a month. And 700 um, children get a hot meal five days a week. 700 children get a hot meal five days a week. So we're talking, I don't know how many of you donors, I'm a monthly, yeah, which is incredible. I'm a monthly donor, which is so easy, I don't even, you know, it just happens. Um, but right now they're needing more money as they come into the end of the year. That's one thing that's really up to them. So they're going to talk about their first-hand experiences with local families, the seniors, the children, and the disabled who depend on them. So come for that. Now this week's presentation is by David Ellison, Complicating the History of the U.S. Civil War, Abraham Lincoln, and the Emancipation Proclamation. People have been asking me the title of this. I was like, is it guns, roses, and no, wait, is it automobiles, automobiles, trains, and I mean, it's just, I had a hard time with the title, but I'm really excited about the talk. There has been an insidious movement on both the political left and right to revise and simplify history. This has been especially true recently with the U.S. Civil War and the Emancipation Proclamation, which is probably the most misunderstood document in, in U.S. history. Dave Ellison, who fell in love with history only when he finally recognized its messiness and then taught it for 36 years, will recomplicate the war between the states in a somewhat controversial but most fascinating way. Dave is also right now, some say, starring in uh, Shakespeare's uh, Twelfth Night at Lakeside Little Theater. He doesn't think he's the star, but other people have been saying he might be. So anyway, it's still, that, that shows until the 13th. So do see it. The audiences are quite raucous, I understand, and they're uh, standing ovations. So please join me in welcoming Dave. Good morning. Good morning. And thank you for coming. I was fearful that uh, a talk on history, people would say, oh God, a snoozer. But how many of you like me when you were in school hated history which is quite an accomplishment because it turns out that I loved history but my teachers convinced me that I hated it and I think that's because they uh, history for a long while it was the Rush Limbaugh school of history Rush Limbaugh said history it's what happened stupid it's very simple. It's that th this is what happened. And so I hated history the same way I hated catechism. It was just an endless list of things that I had to memorize, spit out on the test, and then, I mean, where's the joy, where's the interest, who cares about any of them? And it was my mother who first gave me an, in an inkling uh, that uh, there was another way. I was raised Catholic, and of course we learned all about the saints, the saints who sort of were marble statues who spent their life looking up into heavens and never had an impure thought and so on. Boring. And when I uh, had to be confirmed, we had to pick a name, a confirmation name. So I went to my mom and I said, who should I pick? And she said, pick St. Peter. He was always screwing up. <laughs> I'm going to screw up. And he goes, no, David. And you know, all those other saints, they were perfect. Look at St. Peter. You know, he was vain. He lied three times. And yet, upon that rock, the church was built. He said, he was really human. Now, there's a saint you can believe in. And that's when I went, ooh. And then later, the same thing. I'm going to remember George Washington. You know, he never told a lie and everything. And boring. And then I read a biography called George Washington, The Indispensable Man, which sort of revealed him in all his humanness, all his foibles, and all his messiness, and the messiness of the American Revolution. And, and then I was hooked. That was interesting. And so when I became a history teacher, I just, for me, history is not an endless list 
of names and dates. In fact, I published the dates day one, 10 dates. So the only purpose of a date is to create an intellectual shelf in your mind. So that whenever you hear a date, you say, oh, that was just before, or that was just after. And so suddenly, all dates make sense to you. But to memorize hundreds of dates, what a waste of time. I said, what is history? History for me became philosophy. It is the study of the human condition, the enduring perennial uh, issues that society of all ages face. Stories of courage and cowardice, moral choices made and not made, and fascinating people when you study them. So today, but one thing, history is a slippery thing, and I'll use a family story. Uh, there was, uh, my dad started a second business called Villatron. I won't bore you with what it was. But then, um, you know, there were some problems with the inheritance among my siblings. And I am fourth out of five. There are five siblings in my family. And if you ask any one of us what happened back then, guess how many stories you get? Five. And now that we were all there, and yet five different stories. And it's just we've had to agree not to discuss it because otherwise sparks fly and things get ugly and we'll never convince each other. This is true of all history. Um, I, I, I stole this, in grad school I heard about this technique, it's called 52 Pickup, you know that game? Hey, you wanna play 52 Pickup? Spread them out. Well, I would take a deck of cards and I would just throw them on the ground and I'd say, here's the trouble. Those are all historical events. Now, um, we can't fit them all in the textbook. So someone you know, needs to help us choose. So can I have a volunteer? And usually there's some clown who says, I will, I will. And they, they come up and they pick 10 cards and I look at them and, and then say with disgust, hmm, nothing but kings, queens, and, and jacks. So you aren't gonna tell the story at all of the peons, are you? And I throw them down with disgust. So someone else says, okay, I can do it. And he gets up and, and is far more careful to get a more balanced thing. So then I just look at it and go, hmm, I notice you have more black cards than red cards. Are you prejudiced against red cards? And I threw them down in disgust. Until pretty soon no one will come up and, and, and I say, so what's the point? And they'd say, you're always going to find something to matter. And I say, yeah, but the bigger point is this. Someone is always making choices. Always. And so you've got to ask, who's making the choices? And what are they leaving on the ground? What story did they choose not to tell you? And remember, history is written by the winners, usually by white men. And then I would say, and I'm a white boy from Ohio, and so you should not trust this course. It's because, and the other thing, it's in their constant state of revision. The course I'm teaching you this year is not the same as last year. It's certainly not the same as Miss McElroy down the hall. There's no such thing as history. There are only histories. And if you really want to know what's going on, read many of them. Multiple sources. Trust no one. Anyways, Napoleon also had something about history. He said, what is history? but an agreed upon myth. And I really fear that what's happening in the United States is increasingly it's becoming an agreed upon, simplistic, whitewashed myth. And so I'm gonna go look at the Civil War just as an example of that and what's going on in the United States today. First of all, you've all heard of critical race theory, right? Yeah. Which the right is just they just are attacking it, but you know, they just think this is wrong, wrong, wrong. And I, so I just went to Wikipedia and I said, well, what is critical race theory? Critical race theory is a cross-disciplinary examination by social and civil rights scholars and activists to explore how laws, social and political movements, and media shapes and is shaped by social conceptions of race and ethnicity. Goals include challenging all mainstream and alternative views of racism and racial justice, including conservative, <coughs> liberal, and progressive. The word critical in the name is an academic reference to critical thinking, critical theory, and scholar scholarly criticism rather than criticizing or blaming people. 
Now, how can anyone be against that? But people just say, if you're going to bring up anything that makes us look bad in the history, specifically slavery and oppression of black people, you know, we need to erase that. But it's not just the right, and this really got me upset because I've lived in the Bay Area, and the San Francisco School Board decided to change um, Abraham Lincoln High School's name. Well, he was a racist. Why? Because after the Dakota War of 1862, Lincoln executed 38 Native Americans. Racist. Get his name off there. Now this, you're going to understand the abusive history. If you read the whole thing, the army wanted to execute 264 more. And Abraham Lincoln stepped in, in the middle of the Civil War, where he couldn't dare offend his generals, and yet fought on behalf of those Native Americans and saved the lives of 264 of them. Racist? I don't think so. So, with this in mind, I'm going to launch in on the American Civil War because there are three myths currently going on. The first is, slavery was just a southern practice. Just a few of those slave owners, and you know, we're going to tear down those Confederate monuments and you know, wash our hands and we can just move on and, and for that little dark stain in our history. That's myth number one. Myth number two, the Civil War was fought to end slavery. And anyone who challenges that is a racist. And myth number three, the Emancipation Proclamation freed the slaves. So I'm going to go after each one of these and say, so sorry, life is a lot more complicated than any of us want to admit. Let's <clears throat> begin first with um, slavery was confined to just a few number of, of you know, plantation owners in the South. And a lot of these I just took, you know, I didn't worry about sources here, so please excuse me. Um, first of all, slavery is ens enshrined in our Constitution with the three-fifths compromise. Uh, from the very beginning, they argued, would we count slaves in population figures, which determines power in the House of Representatives? Now, the South, which was hurting for population, said, we, I mean, watch the hypocrisy. The South said, slaves aren't people, but we want to count them as people in population so we get more power. <laughs> and the North said, no, slaves are people. But we don't want to count them in population because we don't want you to have that power. I mean, just immense hypocrisy on both sides. And I would love to have to have been a fly on the wall. Two thirds, no, seven ninths, but they finally came to three fifths. But it gives you an inkling that they were arguing about power. The issue wasn't slavery itself, it was slavery and the issue of power. And power is going to feature prominently in this talk. Number two, New England, you know, Puritans, religious. Oh no, we don't have slaves. But they were very active in the triangle trade of buying and selling and shipping the slaves across the middle passage of the Atlantic. When there was money to be made, they were in full throttle. By the 1850s, slaves were the U.S. largest financial asset. Cotton, the most exported commodity. The U.S. had become the world's second larger producer of textiles. 79% of all Rhode Island textile mills manufactured slave clothing. These mills and Yankee clipper ships delivered more cotton goods to East Africa than Britain and all of its empire combined. Lower Manhattan was populated with cotton brokers, bankers, merchants, shippers, auctioneers, and insurers who profited from that export. Only New York banks were big enough to extend a massive lines of credit to plantation owners so they could buy seed, farming equipment, and people. New York also was home to the water and rail transportation companies that shipped cotton from the south to the north. By some estimates, New York received 40% of U.S. cotton revenue through money in its financial firms, shipping businesses, and insurance companies earned. Harvard. Between Harvard's found, founding in 1636 and the outlawing of slavery in Massachusetts in 1783, quote, Harvard faculty, staff, and leaders enslaved more than 70 individuals. More important is the fact that many major donors whose gift, quote, helped the university build a national reputation 
hire faculty, support students, grow its collections, expand its physical footprint, and develop its infrastructure, made their money from the profits of slavery. One of the most egregious episodes in the sordid history of financing higher education through slavery happened at Georgetown University, one of the premier Catholic universities in the nation. In 1838, with the university facing financial ruin, the Jesuits, who ran the school, sold 272 enslaved black people to plantations in Louisiana, where living and working to conditions for the enslaved were as harsh as anywhere in the country. The money from that sale kept Georgetown afloat. Like most U.S. colleges, Georgetown discriminated against African Americans in admissions and hiring well into the 20th century. Edward E. Baptist, a historian at Cornell University and the author of The Half Has Never Been Told, Slavery and the Making of American Capitalism, wrote, the slavery economy of the U.S. is deeply tied financially to the North to the point that we can say that people who were buying financial products in these other places were in effect owning slaves and were extracting money from the labor of enslaved people. Christy Clark Puchera said, we misunderstand the institution of slavery when we only locate it on the plantation. We misunderstand the history of the United States as a whole when we do not acknowledge that the institution of slavery was national rather than regional. So sorry. We were a slave nation. And any attempt to whitewash that is just the worst form of revisionist mythology ever was, and we need to own up to it. Myth number two, the Civil War was entirely about slavery, and I'm gonna say yes and mainly no. Huge issues about power. Uh, to begin this, we need to understand our first government. Oh, first of all, have you ever wondered about the strange name of the United States? I mean, most other countries, they have one word names. France, England, Germany. We're the United States of America. Why a five for such a bizarre name? And that's because we really didn't want a nation. We wanted 13 independent nations loosely aligned in a confederation. And our first government was called the Articles of Confederation. The states agreed to get along. That was our nation. But the states were supreme. All right? That's very important you understand that. The states were supreme. All right? Now we tried that, and it failed utterly. So they came back, and they came back with the U.S. Constitution, which created a very strong central government, which we had feared. We didn't want another England or whatever. But we ended up with a very strong federal government, which people like Thomas Jefferson were aghast at. Now, this argument between state and federal never went away. In fact, we still have it today. I mean, in California, has legalized marijuana. The federal government says no, and whoops, who wins? And <clears throat> anyways, um, Let's go to 1832 and 1833 with the, what was called the nullification crisis. And the North had all the power, and they had all the manufacturing. And they wanted to for force the South, which was agrarian, to buy their manufactured goods and not England's. So they put a tariff on all of England's goods. And since the North had all the political power, they got it through. And the South said, now wait a minute, that's not fair. And the vice president, Andrew Jackson, was the president. Uh, John C. Calhoun from uh, South Carolina was the vice president. He said, that's not fair. And the state of South Carolina is going to nullify this tariff. Nullification. State rules. We will just not follow federal law. And Andrew Jackson said, the hell you will. And he got his army together and he said, I am going to invade South Carolina. I'm going to hang the nullifiers beginning with my own vice president. And we came this close to civil war in 1830 and no one's talking about slavery. It's about power. And this becomes uh, uh, even more clear uh, the, the, the power between the North and the, and the uh, 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 Be assured the South never had the population. And so they, they were completely disenfranchised in the House of Representatives. 
and all the immigrants were heading to the factories in the north. So every year the South had less and less power in the, in the House of Representatives. But at least there's the Senate. Now the Senate, there was this uneasy balance where the North and the South had the same number of senators, two per state. But then Manifest Destiny opens a can of worms because now we're going to be spreading west and we're going to be adding states, which is going to upset the balance of power. So once again, there was this huge argument, and uh, this fellow, by the way, Henry Clay, is called the Great Compromiser. He's the one who stepped in between John C. Calhoun and Andrew Jackson and said, we don't need to go to war here. Well, in 1820, he'd already done that, and he came up with the Compromise of 1820, the Missouri Compromise. Missouri became a slave state, Maine became a free state, and then we drew a line heading west saying we're going to divide between north and south and we're going to keep this parity, keep the balance of power in the Senate. Well, with the, we have now know what was to come, but that line headed directly through what would become California. And you could say that the discovery of gold in California sparked the Civil War because we were going to creep our way west until gold was discovered. And then the population, I never remember numbers, so it's probably something like this. The population of San Francisco in one year went from 5,000 to 25,000. And then the next year, we're talking hundreds of thousands. And so now California has to become a state. Now, we need a state government. It's gonna be free. So the Compromise of 1850, California becomes a free state and the South is now disenfranchised in the Senate. Okay, 1860, fast forward, Abraham Lincoln, who, as I'll talk about in a minute, is, um, he hates slavery, but he doesn't want it to spread. And so the Southerners don't want anyone like him elected. Abraham Lincoln became President of the United States without a single Southern electoral vote. Zero. And he gets to choose the members of the Supreme Court. Now, if you're a Southerner, let's just take slavery, put it aside. If you're a Southerner, you have no power in the House. You've now lost power in the Senate. Your electoral votes clearly don't matter. And the, the presidents are going to choose the Supreme Court. The South was completely disenfranchised. Would you want to secede? I would. Anyways, let's talk about the Civil War being about slavery. First one, when, when it became clear that the South was gonna, gonna leave, the, um, they came up with the Corwin Amendment, the 13th, what would have been the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. It would forever protect the right to own slaves. They said, you don't need to leave. We are going to enshrine in the Constitution your right to own slaves Forever. They seceded anyways. There must have been something else on the table. Um, um, General Lee, the commander-in-chief of the Confederate forces, Abraham Lincoln asked him to be commander of the Northern forces. He'd be a good choice because uh, he had said, quote, Lee, slavery is a moral and a political evil but he went with the South. Specifically, he went with his state of Virginia. Now, he was a West Point graduate, had made a career in the federal U.S. Army, but he said, if it comes down to a choice between the United States of America and Virginia, I go with Virginia. I will defend my state, even though I hate slavery. U.S. Grant, who eventually became commander-in-chief of the Northern Forces until two years before, the, the Civil War, owned a slave. He married his wife. His name was William Jones. Grant wrote to his friend, I was never an abolitionist. I'm not even what could be called anti-slavery. He became commander-in-chief of the Northern Forces. I don't see how you argue that this is about slavery. The border states, not all the states seceded. Delaware, Kentucky, Maryland, Missouri. Slave states stayed in the Union. If this was a war about slavery, they would have seceded. They didn't think it was about slavery. They stayed. 
Approximately 75% of the Confederate soldiers did not own slaves. I mean, are they going to put their lives in the line just on the chance that maybe someday they might be able to own a slave? Really? I don't believe that. There were race riots in New York City. White people were murdering black people for taking their jobs. Do you think the people of the North were going to fight a war to free all these African-American slaves so that they, they could compete with them? Really? General McClellan, who, until Grant, he was sort of the chief Union. I mean, poor Lincoln went through a long series of really horrible um, generals. McClellan was one of them. And McClellan, when Lincoln was thinking of doing the Emancipation Proclamation, um, McClellan went to him and he said, don't do this. If you sign the Emancipation Proclamation, I fear that half my soldiers will throw down their weapons and say, I didn't join this army to free no slaves. Let's look at Lincoln himself. Lincoln said, on the one hand, if slavery is not wrong, then nothing is wrong. He was very clear. On the other hand, he also said, slavery is like a cancer. We can't cut it out because the patient will bleed to death, meaning it'll lead to secession. But we can't let it spread. So he was, he would, he was not an abolitionist. He did, opposed the spread of slavery into the new territories. He said, and I quote, if I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. For Lincoln, there was only one issue on the table, keeping this nation together, period, end of story. There's a very famous anecdote of one of his generals came to him and said, hey, let's change the flag and take you know, the, the Confederate stars off the flag. And Lincoln looked at him and said, you idiot, we're fighting to keep those stars on the flag. For Lincoln, he staked his presidency on one issue. He would keep this nation together. The South wanted to secede. And just like Andrew Jackson in 1830, he said, you do not have the right to leave. And so we went to war. The issue was states' rights. Does a state have a right to secede or not? Lincoln said, you don't. And look at the names of the armies. The Confederacy, harking back to the Articles of Confederation, loose federal government, strong state government, and they call themselves the Confederacy. And what did the North call itself? The Army of Liberation? They call themselves the Union. It's very clear. Slavery was not on the table. It may have got us here, but it's not what the war was about. But then, everything changed. Why? And how? And this is where, for me, it gets really interesting. Okay, 10 minutes, I gotta rush. Okay, um, biggest plan of the North was the Anaconda Plan. The North had everything, money, factories, steel, everything, and the Navy. And they were going to squeeze the South, an embargo on the South. And so they shut down all the ports, and they were fighting to shut down the Mississippi. They were just going to strangle the South. Problem, England is our chief trading powder. They need the cotton. England has a stronger Navy than we do. England can intervene whenever it wants and end this war. And England doesn't give a damn about whether we stay together or not. In fact, England would love to see us split into two and become weaker. That's to their advantage. So Lincoln has to have a quick war. And it should have been, except for one minor problem. The best generals went to the South. And general after general after general went into the South and got their butts kicked by, by Robert E. Lee. And they came back with their tail between the legs, and there was this revolving door of generals going in. And every and Lee was outnumbered in every battle, and he won every battle except when he invaded the North. But we'll rush on through that. Um, so what? What? So Lincoln's in trouble. This war is dragging out for two years. 
What if England intervenes? What can you do? Well, what do you do when you're playing a game and you're losing? You change the rules. And so Lincoln published the Emancipation Proclamation. And it said, yes, the slaves, it was a promissory note. You know, you know how many slaves were free the day after Lincoln signed it? He didn't free any slaves in the slave states. I'm sorry, the uh, border states. They were allowed to keep their slaves. It said, the southern slaves in the Confederacy will be free if we win the war. Guess what this war is now about? Slavery, England had outlawed slavery in 1833. England cannot be seen preventing the end of slavery in the United States. In one fell swoop, England is now off the table. What is more, 180,000 African, free African Americans joined the Union Army. What? You know, whew, that's a shot in the arm. Once this was about freeing our brethren in the South, sign me up. And finally, every single slave in the South they didn't give a damn about secession. Once word got out that if the Union wins, we are free, every single slave in the South is now an agent for the North. It was a brilliant, cunning move to win the war. But everything has a cost. And this hit me one day, I was in the middle of class, and then it hit me and I went, oh my God, and this is suppressed. Prior to the Emancipation Proclamation, if we had one great victory, the South might have surrendered, we all big hug, the South comes back. Would the South ever surrender now? It's the end of their economy and their way of life. Which means, once he signed that document, he's going to have to bring them, the South to its knees. It's going to become, and it did, the bloodiest war in U.S. history. If you add up all the deaths in the American Revolution, War of 1812, World War I, World War II, all of them together do not add up to the Civil War. Lincoln committed us to the bloodiest battle. It was a ruthless document. Ruthless. And he called in Grant, and he said, listen, you don't need to win. You just need to keep fighting. And he said, quote, it's a simple game of arithmetic. We have more men. Don't be like the other generals and say, you got your butt kicked and come back. Don't come back. Just keep attacking. I will send more men. And Grant was called Grant the Butcher. If the Union had lost, Lincoln would have gone down in history as the worst general in U.S. history, and Grant's name, the Butcher, would have remained. He committed us to total war. This means civilian targets are now prime targets. And uh, you know, uh, General Sherman, his famous 60-mile swap to the sea, burning Atlanta to the ground. Sheridan went through the Shenandoah, did the same. If this w weren't under Lincoln's precise orders, he certainly approved it. Bring them to their knees. It was a ruthless document. Now, he won. And he, uh, but it's just an executive order, which, as you all know, can be turned. Now, on the one hand, Lincoln was uh, this very famous uh, movie st uh, starring Daniel Day-Lewis, uh, uh, um, phenomenal, called, I think it's called Lincoln, and it's about his fight to get the 13th Amendment passed, which forever banned slavery, which, thank you, Abraham Lincoln. Um, but, um, you know, there's another myth that is really in error, and I'll end with this. Um, everyone says, you know, what's the big deal of reparations and everything? I mean, come on, get over it. Slavery ended with the Civil War, correct? How many know that? Slavery ended with the Civil War. And there's a very famous book um, called Slavery by Another Name, The Re-Enslavement of Black Americans from the Civil War to World War II by Douglas A. Blackman. 
and it was made into a movie too. They, the South found a loophole in the 13th Amendment. Um, um, you know, uh, forced labor was outlawed with the exception of if you are convicted of a, uh, a felony and then you can be put on the chain gang. And for the next century, the South criminalized being black. And they just went around and, you know, arresting blacks right and left and putting them on the chain gang forever. And that's another myth that we need to go back and change. So, I'll end. the only thing is, I mean, first of all, slavery was not just a Southern sin. So sorry, we cannot wash our hands of that. We all have the blood of slavery and the shame of slavery on our hands, all of us. And the Civil War was about so much more. It was far more complicated than slavery. And the Emancipation Proclamation was a complex and ruthless document. If we have the courage and intelligence to look beyond the convenient anesthetizing myths and embrace the messy and sometimes ugly complexity of our history, then history becomes fascinating. And so do we. Thank you. lucky to have you as a teacher. Oops, amazing. Okay, this is the question and answer period if I can get the mic back together. Um, so what, if you raise your hands, I'll bring a mic to you. If for any reason you don't feel comfortable holding onto the mic yourself, I'll hold, I'll hold on to it myself for you. And uh, the mic works really wonderful if you keep them really close. Stand. Yes, I can. Um, David, first of all, excellent, excellent, excellent. Could you add something about the privatization of prisons? Because that's certainly one of the uh, most serious things that's been happening with the fact that uh, individuals now... Th Closer they, are, th they are putting more people, more blacks, in prisons because there's money to be made. So the privatization of prisons has also complicated the issue. It's more messy. Oh, no, I, I'm going to take it much farther than that. Okay. There's a very famous quote by uh, Nixon's uh, aide, Ehrlichman, I forget his first name. Very famous quote. It's uh, me, it's uh, me. Afterwards. And it, it concerns the whole war on drugs. And he said, and he just came clean, he said, listen, if we was in a war on drugs, we had two enemies, the anti-war people and the civil rights people. And so we just used the wrong drugs to take them both down. And then we created this extremely racist criminal justice system that an example would be same drug, crack and cocaine. Co same, exact same drug. Cocaine, that's a white person's drug. You silly boy, misdemeanor. Oh, crack, poor person's drug, felony and then you are forever denied your vote. And so the war on drugs is a thinly veiled but highly successful attempt to completely disenfranchise an entire race of people in the United States today. Which is not only to say that also you're taking you know, the fathers away from their kids and then creating poverty and just, it just and I'm gonna, you know, that. Listen, I was a public school teacher. If you don't think the American public school system is not overtly racist, there is a reason that we've put all our poor kids of color into inner city schools together and then denied them good teachers and funding. That is not by accident. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> David, fabulous, thanks. Are the textbooks taught to children in the South different than the history books taught in the North? Absolutely. The, um, this gets weird. According to the, I think it's 10th Amendment to the Constitution, is that they really wanted to try to limit the power of the federal government. And the 10th Amendment to the Constitution says that any power not expressly given to the federal government belongs with the states. All right, and that includes education. Now, currently, there's been a coup because all the states are hurting for money. So, the, and the federal 
makes these mandates about special education, which are extremely expenses, expensive, but they're unfunded. So you got to do this, but we aren't going to give you the money to do it. So now all the states are hurting for money. And then the federal government says, here's some money, but in order to get our money, you have to do everything we tell you to do, a.k.a. no child left behind. And don't get me started on that atrocity. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, so that's, um, you know, that's one way. But you've got states like the state of Texas that are now revising their textbooks to, you know, you know slavery was really benign. The, you know, the, the slaves, they were happy. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's ludicrous. But the bottom line is, is that all textbooks suck. Have you ever tried to read one? I mean, it's not only that. I mean, they're poorly written, number one. They're deadly boring. And, and, and I went, I, you know, we, we get state money to get these textbooks, and I went to the principal and I said, let's just not get a textbook. Let's get all these other smaller histories and stuff like that. And the, and the uh, principal burst out laughing. And she said, David, you love history. Most of the other teachers, if they don't have that textbook, they're lost. <laughs> and so, you know, I get the whole thing is who's becoming our teachers? But off that soapbox. Anybody else out here? Okay. The issue of states' rights is not dead. Abortion is an example of turning it over to the states again. Next is uh, same-sex marriage. And that will be followed by interracial marriage and turning the power back over to the states. Now that's my political view, but I have a question for you. Robert E. Lee is venerated in the South, and yet Robert E. Lee was the greatest traitor to the United States of America because he was fighting against not the Union Army, but the United States Army. Would you agree with any of that? Um, yes and no, because as usual, life is complicated. Do you recognize who this is? This is yeah. Benjamin Franklin, by the way. Oh, excellent, <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, Robert E. Lee comes from a family of slave owners, so when I say he said it was a moral and political evil, there was a little bit of, he believed that, but. They were still a slaveholding family. So, you know, that's number one. But number two for him, he had a choice between betray the United States of America or betray his state of Virginia. And for him, that was a non-issue. I mean, he thought differently than we do today. And there's a very um, famous anecdote that used to be told about uh, this U.S. Civil War before this the mythology that it was only about slavery. It was, before the Civil War, we said, the United States of America are a good nation. Mm -hmm. And after the Civil War, we said the United States of America is. We, we made it singular. And so it was the triumph of the federal government over the state government. And, but, I mean, what has happened, I mean, there has been a coup in the United States today, particularly with the Supreme Court. And, all right, and, and that is, by the way, for me, that is the first step towards fascism, all right? And, and so we are in, in dire straits, and there is much at stake in the upcoming election. But you are correct, is that now issues like abortion have been thrown back to the states where, the, where they are going to be fought on the state-by-state -state basis, as will gay marriage and everything else. So I think you are prescient in that. And it just points out to the fact that these are dangerous times. If I might just follow up with, with Lee, what separates Lee from the deplorables who attacked the United States Capitol on January 6th? Well, I mean... Uh-oh, you two, we're going to have a duel off. <laughs> I'll, I'll just say this. I mean, I, I, I'm a little uncomfortable by tearing down all the Confederate statues because, you know, they're history and, and we need to still study them. But Robert E. Lee's was hard for me because every military historian says he was one of the greatest military leaders in U.S. history. He was revered by both the North and the South. 
as being a very chivalrous man of tremendous integrity. After the war, they wanted to use his name. He could have made millions, and he said the Lee name is not for sale at any price. I think there is too much to admire about him. I mean, if, when we want to start looking to tear, I mean, let's tear down the, the, you know, the Washington Monument, for God's sakes. He was a slave owner. Let's tear down the, the Jefferson Memorial. I mean, once we go down there, we've got nobody left. Unless we accept that we are all flawed, and we are all doing the best we can. And so I find too much to admire about Robert E. Lee to, to, to vilify him that way. I'm uh, reading a book called The 1619 Project, and in it, I believe I read that at some point, Lincoln toyed with the idea of colonization, sending all the blacks to an island somewhere and let them start their own country. Is that right? That is, that is absolutely correct. I mean, and one thing to remember is that Abraham Lincoln, like everyone else, had an evolution. All right. And so, you know, in some of his speeches in the uh, Lincoln-Douglas debates, he came right out and said, you know, the blacks are not equal to whites. Racist, okay? But if he said anything else, he was unelectable. And I'd like to counter that with an anecdote that when um, uh, Frederick Douglass had a long interview with, a, with Lincoln, and it came out, and everyone gathered around him and said, so what do you think, what do you think? And he said, that is the first white man who has ever treated me completely as his equal. And that's the President of the United States sat down with him and, and, and just felt, you are my equal. So I, I, I think, you know, Abraham, it's like Malcolm X, who went from, you know, whites and blacks cannot get along, and then he, he went to Mecca and saw that they could. And he came back and he toned himself down quite a bit. I think we have to allow for A, just the realities of trying to get elected, and B, that people go through evolution. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I think of my sister, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm gay, and I came out to my evangelical sister, you know, I mean, it was ugly, and she told all my brothers and my parents to pray for my soul, and, and then 10 years later, I was working for the AIDS Foundation and describing, and, and she just came out and said, well, gay marriage is the only answer. Like, Who are you and what have you done with, you know, with my sister? And that's because, you know, she had an evolution. And I said, what? And she said, I think you didn't choose to be gay. The closet is a really unhealthy place to be. And he said, that's on us. And so she had an evolution. I think Abraham Lincoln had a really profound evolution. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, my family were slave owners. I left the Get South out. in 1973. <laughs> and um, I had this discussion with somebody recently, a black woman, and I said, I wish we could have something like Tutu's truth and reconciliation uh, thing. But it's such a long time ago. It was 200 years. She said, Marianne. Jim Crow. I would, I would like to ask you if you consider doing another talk from the end of the Civil War to the end of Jim Crow sometime. I think it would be. Oof, well, I'm just. You know, in 20 minutes. You know. Yeah, well, I. <laughs> that is way beyond my ken. I'm not an, a, an expert on that. But the final uh, project that my students did at the end of the year, they created a timeline, sort of a review for the final exam. And so you put some of the important, really important dates, but they also had to put periods and you know, big bars along the timeline. And one of them I called the long, dark night. And that included all the way through Jim Crow, through you know, the, the civil rights movement. But you know, the civil rights movement, it's not like, okay, we're done now. I mean, we are still, I mean, the, the, our criminal justice system is still racist. My, you know, my brother um, nearly died from two overdoses of heroin, and that he, if, were he not white and wealthy, he would be in prison today. Period. End of story. That is white privilege, plain and simple. And I've got uh, another. Uh, my uh, nephew is a lawyer fighting on the um, the uh, home foreclosures, 
And he just says our entire loan system and our foreclosure system, racist, racist, racist. And how can it be in the wealthiest nation on earth? Flint, Michigan still doesn't have clean water, for God's sakes. I mean, racism. Oh, open mic, Dave? Come on. <laughs> There's a book that you could read. It's called The Color of Law. It's by Richard Spina. And he delineates slavery in all of its forms and the duplicity of the United States government. It is here today. It is in the real estate. It is in the banks. Louder, please. Oh, it's in the real estate. It's in the banks. It's even in the government. The government has created laws that the real estate and the banks have to abide by that encourages racism. So if you want to read a book about how it's throughout the health industry, throughout the bank, throughout the bank industry, the food industry, read it. It's called The Color of Law. It's by Ruben Stein. Oh, that wasn't a question. <laughs> Yeah, you know, we only allow questions, but then, you know, people do whatever the hell they want. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a bit nervous, but I'm going to just ask anyways. Um, I'm, often, I'm often really aware in, in, when we're talking about history, about the absence of 50% of the population. And I'm just wondering, if is, um, is there anything that you can comment on about women in, during the... Um, kind of the Civil War era, or is there any hope uh, for um, that the situation can be rectified, that, that women are brought back into the picture or brought into the picture and not just always kind of left out? Yeah, well, I tried in my own thing. I used to create these one-page biographies of people who never made the, you know, the history textbook. And some, you know, a lot of them were the women that, that whose stories never get told. And uh, they're phenomenal. Um, you know, I think of uh, one. How many have heard of? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be off on it. How many have heard of Theodora? Theodora, who was the empress in the Byzantine Empire, with uh, I mean, talk about an amazing woman. And then there's Nzinga, who was uh, in Africa, who became. I mean, they, they abound, and I think there is a very large movement to try to reinclude them in history because, you know, if we need role models. Women need role models. And white men have written the history and just written women out of it uh, until recently. And you know, now there's a movement to suppress everything. Um, so, but until recently, there was a huge movement to write women in actually in California, they passed a law and said, sorry, we have to tell LGBTQ history as well. So that was a monumental step forward. Um, but now it's, it's the gentleman over there said, you know, the, the forces are marshalling to undo all of that. Hi, David. It distracts me that you talk about an evolution of your sister, that we are, we are the evolution right now, right here, that our, we want to freeze history as if it happened then. But this is, this is the history and the forces that are working both sides, in the middle and up and down, are, are part of what history is too that needs to be included. Let us look at, or look at what they did. Let's look at what are we are. Can't hear you. What are we in the middle of? Because we're in the middle of the evolution as well. Well, I made current events a huge part of my history. I was very upfront. I told them from the beginning. I said, what's the point of studying history unless it gets you involved here and now? because we live in history, we are making history, and your job in a democracy is to be a part of that. And if you want to be ignorant, fine, go find a dictatorship and let go. But so sorry, democracy is a participatory event. They want you to be ignorant. They don't want you to know. And so I said, this course, I hope to radicalize you. 
I mean, the, I mean, the, the suffrage movement was a big piece in, in my course, trying to, because it also became sort of a, a, um, a what do you call it, a, a, role, a, a model of all movements, because, you know, this, the suffrage movement split, came back together, split, came back together, and it was the same arguments that all movements have. Shall we be patient? Shall we, you know, shall we try national or shall we go state by state? And how far are we willing to go? And I said, you know, the biggest thing is I said writing. And writing was a huge component because writing is power. If I teach you history and I don't teach you how to write, what a waste of time. But I said, my job is to make you give a damn about the history today and to, and, and to get you involved so that you believe I am a mover and a shaker. I have responsibility. And we all have that here. And my fear is that some people have just... I'm so sick of the United States, I'm embarrassed, so I came over here, there I'm done, I wash my hands of the United States. Wrong! Thank you so much for coming.